thank you. Good morning. So, yes, I was tasked with uh, trying to explain how we pay our school-based administrators. And by doing this, I'm going to have to take, take, go back a little bit in, as to how we got to where we are. So, um, yeah, hopefully that will make it easier to explain why we're doing what we're doing uh, currently. Um, you should have in your packet a copy of the salary schedules as well as um, a two-page document of some of the legislation that has created some of the change to the initial um, school-based administrative schedules that were initially developed in, or uh, adopted in 1993. So this is 23 years of little minor changes that have had minor or significant impacts. Um, School-based administrators, these are including the assistant principals and the principals, those people that determine effective teachers, the hiring, the training, determining assignments, the class size, as well as being the instructional leaders and the business managers of the school. So we start out um, with, it did start simple. Uh, it started with a bachelor's degree teacher schedule. And then when that teacher, if they choose, chose, got a master's degree, they received a 10% uh, salary differential. And then if they became an assistant principal, they received a 1% uh, differential on top of that. Then the principal schedules were based on the assistant principal schedules, but they were kind of shifted depending on the classification of, at the time, it was one to seven classifications, depending on the size of the school. So that was how it all started. So when the General Assembly provided an increase to the bachelor level teacher, the, those increases flowed through all the schedules um, that were adopted by the General Assembly. Then there came some adjustments through that 23 year period. Uh, safe schools and ABC <coughs> incentives uh, were in 1998, 99, and 2000, where there was incentive pay for um, assistant principals and principals based on their ABC performance and their safe and orderly schools. There was exceptions to classifications, um, noting that there were some schools that even though they may be small, so the principal may be classified at a low pay grade, were challenging to recruit for, for instance, our alternative schools. So there was an exception there. National board pay was instituted in 1997 as part of the Exit Public Schools Act, which provided a differential for teachers at 12% and thereby uh, making them uh, a higher pay than the assistant principals. We had the freeze or the no step years, um, as Lanier talked about, uh, which created a shift uh, in the beginning steps of what was a beginning step, the definition, and also extended the number of steps that we have in the current schedules. And then most recently we had the severing of the tie of the teacher and instructional support position salary schedules from the school-based administrative schedules. Um, and that was, um, that uh, created different legislation to uh, try and fix some, some, uh, some of the issues that occurred. And I'm gonna get into some of those as we try and explain how these, teach how these uh, school based administrators are being paid. So who are we talking about? We have um, approximately 5,200 school based administrators and you can see the breakdown here. You'll see that there are more assistant principals. Um, there are quite a significant number of assistant principals that are locally funded. Uh, keep in mind the current funding formula for assistant principals, your a school has to be 985 students in order to generate one 10-month assistant principal schedule. And with the number of schools in our state being significantly smaller than that, the locals are supplementing with those positions. This is the expenditures from 2015, what the state is funding and the locals. The base salary, that is the um, based on the salary schedules. So we're looking at 304 million statewide and you can see the uh, difference between the local and the state funded portion. The state is funding about 80% of that. And then uh, inversely for the local supplements, uh, the locals are funding about 32, well, over $32 million in local supplements um, to those salary schedules. This is a point of reference, a step increase for um, school-based administrators, including benefits, is about $3.6 million. So, um, and it has been a declining amount um, uh, to fund that step uh, for various reasons as we'll, we'll get into. So starting with the assistant principals, and I'd like to refer you to the salary schedule. It might be easier to see this as a more of a show and tell. 
um, the salary schedules on the first page. You'll see this is the assistant principal um, schedule. And um, it has eight columns, uh, excuse me, seven columns. Uh, if you ignore the 1% and just stick to the base. These schedules are actually very similar to the old teacher and instructional support schedule. They started out with, um, I think, 30 steps. Um, they were, as I stated, based off the master teacher schedule. And um, a, an assistant principal was placed on, based on their years of experience on that um, column. All assistant principals are required to hold a master's uh, degree. And they, um, they also are eligible to receive uh, additional pay for the advanced degree or the doctorate, uh, just like the teachers, instructional support, and the, uh, the principal. And they are eligible for the longevity pay. So the exceptions to this um, are the, those columns to the right, the plus 1% to 6%. This was from the 1998 99 2000 General Assembly decision to provide um, incentive pay. It was initially a one time bonus payment that became permanent into the salary schedule. And that pay still continues to this day. There are 6% of our state funded assistant principals receive this pay, um, and it accounts for about 109 FTE in the state um, of those state funded. Okay, so the second exception, which is the one where it gets very complicated. Um, so in 2009, I, I talked about the national board pay uh, and a teacher in 1997 as part of the Excellent Public Schools Act, a teacher was eligible to receive 12% differential if they got their national board certification. The intent at the time was to provide a career path, additional pay for a teacher to stay in the classroom and not feel like they had to go into an administrative position to receive additional pay. <coughs> so by design, it was reserved only for those teachers who instructed students for at least 70% of the time. The intent was for the other 30% where they could be mentoring or being a lead teacher. In 2009, um, the decision was decided that if a teacher wanted to go into an assistant principalship, then they should have to lose that pay. And so provision was put in for those teachers who became an assistant principal after July 1, 2009, that they could um, basically take the higher of the two pay. It only, it didn't reference national board into that uh, provision, but only national board certified teachers would, be, would benefit from the provision. There was a hand, and then again, it was only those that became an ass assistant principal after July 1, 2009. So it was a very hand, it was a small handful of, of teachers or assistant principals in the state. Um, we handled it manually at the department to certify those individuals for the school districts. Recently, the, the July 1, 2009 cutoff was removed, so it applied to all assistant principals. And in addition, since the severing and the change in the structure of the teacher pay, and the significant increases on the teacher salary schedule and no increases to the school-based administrative schedule, we in effect have every 99% well, of the assistant principals could be eligible for the teacher, for the higher pay, being, in other words, being paid off the teacher salary schedule instead of being paid on the assistant principal schedule. There is a catch, because that would be somewhat easy, um, because we would just say, well, you just get paid the higher of the two, um, which would be, by definition, the teacher salary schedule. However, it does state in that that it only applies to those that move from a teacher position to an assistant principal position without a break in service. So I'll explain how this kind of plays out in four scenarios. All these individuals have 15 years of experience, and in our scenario number one, we have a teacher who became an assistant principal without a break in service. Pretty simple, probably the situation that was initially um, thought of. So as a teacher, their pay would be 4,785. As an assistant principal with 15 years, they would receive 4,434. Due to the provision that it was set in, 
this individual is eligible to be paid the higher, the $4,785. So a $351 a month differential, and they are eligible to, to not, in effect, lose pay. In our scenario number two, um, we have an assistant principal who is currently out of state, and they have 15 years of experience, and they've been working actually five years as an assistant principal in Ohio, and they decide to come down to this wonderful state. And again, the same numbers um, are, are shown there. But because this, this individual was not a teacher who moved into an assistant principalship without a break in service, they are to be paid at the 4,434 level. So you have two individuals. Arguably, the second may be uh, more experienced with their assistant principal uh, experience. However, they are paid the base rate at the lower amount. So in our third scenario, we have a teacher who was in North Carolina. They were working 15 years, and they leave on in 2014 on the year of maternity leave. They didn't think they were going to come back, and they thought they were going to stay home with their children. But when they were out, they they uh, got their masters in school uh, in school administration, and they thought, okay, you know, I'd like to move into an assistant principalship. They come back to North, uh, come back to the school districts, and because they have that break in service they are not eligible under the provision. So when they left in 2014, their pay was 4,785. When they returned, uh, as an assistant principal, the school district, uh, it, the, the base pay for that individual is now 4,434. So they actually, if they want to take that school-based ministry of that assistant principal position, um, either the school district is supplementing the differential or that individual would be losing, uh, receiving a lower pay. And in the final scenario, uh, a teacher earns a master's of school administration in 2015 and moves into an assistant principal position. This employee, uh, when you're doing the comparison, and I'm afraid I have the 4,785 there, they actually would not be eligible for the master's pay. So their teacher's salary would be at the bachelor's level because they missed the cutoff for the master's pay. So they know, uh, because the, general, the, the salary schedules don't uh, fund that for those people who received a master's after 2000, or started taking it after um, 2013. Um, their bachelor's pay would be 4,350. Uh, their assistant principal pay would be 4,434. So it's not advantageous and they would be paid at the 434. So we have four individuals um, who are all doing the same job with the same experience and the same uh, degree level, but by matter of circumstance, are eligible for a different pay on the pay schedule, and the state would fund them um, uh, differently. So other issues related to specifically, and, and they were saying this kind of applies to the assistant principal schedule, what, what other issues are, have been created specifically from the no step? So an assistant principal has to have three years of teaching experience to become an assistant principal to get that master's degree. And so as a result, initially back in 2009, the beginning step was at zero to nine years of, excuse me, zero to four years of experience. But due to the um, no step, every year of a no step, that bottom step increased by one. So currently, the uh, the beginning step is zero to nine years of experience. So it takes 10 years for an assistant principal to get off that beginning step. Currently, we have 10% of our assistant principals that are state funded. It would think that number would increase if I included the locally funded assistant principals, because generally they are the lower experienced um, assistant principals that are funded out of local. Um, so that's about 183 FTEs sitting on the beginning step. On the other end of the scale, for each year that there was a uh, no step, an additional year was added to the top of the scale. So now it takes 36 years for an assistant principal to receive, to be eligible for the top pay um, within his class. So those are the assistant principles, which are, are fairly simple um, because they are similar to the uh, teachers and instructional support. The issues that are related to them are similar to what 
uh, the General Assembly and others were working with um, before the, the big change in the funding in the teacher salary schedules. So moving on to the principles. We have different classifications, and as you go through your packet, you'll see um, the different classifications. Each page is a different class of principles, and it is determined based on the number of state-paid certified employees in that school. So it is state-funded, not if they have uh, federally funded employees in that school. The state does not consider that for the classification. The classifications range from 0 to 10. Um, teachers or certified employees in that school at a principal one to a hundred plus certified employees for a principal eight. And obviously these are the large, um, you know, Charlotte, Mac, Wake County um, schools. And then at the other end we have the, we have some very small um, schools out, out in the state. So the second item to figure out where to place your principal is to look at um, the number of years of experience that the individual has. Uh, for a principal, unlike an assistant principal, all their educator experience is considered teaching experience. It is for a principal, when you are a principal, you also receive principal experience. So you have your teaching experience plus your principal experience. Prior to July 1, 2009, for every three years that a principal was a principal, they received an extra year of experience. In effect, obviously they didn't have an extra year, um, but in effect what it was doing was uh, moving the principal up the salary schedule at a faster rate and could be considered more of a longevity or um, that kind of uh, recognition. The uh, next item to consider as to what column the uh, principal is going to be paid at is you need to look back at 2000, uh, excuse me, 1997 through 2000 to see if the individual had an ABC bonus um, percentage or a uh, safe uh, and orderly schools percentage. And that could range from 1% to 6% depending on how many of the measures uh, the, the school met at that time. It's important to know that those incentive pays stick with that individual regardless of where they move to schools, if, they, if they've if they moved to a different school or been moved to a different school by the school district, they still are eligible to receive um, that uh, ABC and safe schools incentive. It is permanent on their record. And so we currently have 12% of our principals who continue to receive that incentive. Principals, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, with assistant principals, are also eligible for longevity pay. So here are the exceptions. Uh, the, um, there is a recognition that alternative schools and cooperative innovative high schools may be small in uh, nature, but complex in, in the way they are. So they are paid at a minimum of a principal three, which is the equivalent of, I think it's 24, teachers um, when in fact they uh, 22 to 32 teachers when in fact they may have many uh, less teachers than that and then just like with the um, assistant principal provision we have uh, a provision that is kind of brand new that says an assistant principal who becomes a principal without a break in service shall be paid at least the minimum the amount she would have, she or he would have, um, as an assistant principal employed in that LEA. Um, this gets uh, really kind of tricky and having gone through the four scenarios, I'm not going to um, labor through um, different scenarios on this, but, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this slide's a little out of order. So this actually shows the percentage, uh, the distribution by uh, of our principals across the state. So you can see that about 48% or um, 1,150 principals are paid at that principal three and principal four, which kind of represents probably the average size of our, of our schools in the state. So going back to our exception provision, we have, um, here's a breakdown. You have an employee with 25 years of experience in national board certified pay, and they, the employee wants to become a principal three. 
you can see here the huge differential between the pay of a teacher pay is 6110 um, based on the, you know, the new schedules versus an assistant principal pay is 5050 and a principal three pay is 5119 So there's about a $981 difference by month um, between that teacher pay and the principal three pay. However, it is only this provision is only advantageous if um, they were eligible for a teacher pay as an assistant principal pay. Because the provision talks about an assistant principal that becomes an, a principal, they're eligible for the assistant principal pay, and the assistant principal pay is less than the principal pay. Then you have to go back one more step to say, okay, well, if they were, as a principal, were they eligible for the teacher pay? So that's where we get back to going kind of one more step back to say, okay, well, we need to see where this person was, et cetera, and run through all those numbers. In fact, looking at this breakdown, um, I talked about the principal eight being over 100, 100 state paid, only state paid certified personnel. Um, and we're talking about the large 2,000 um, student uh, high schools. Their base pay is still $215 less a month than that 25-year <coughs> teacher with, um, with national board pay. So um, just keeping that in mind where the, uh, kind of the differences in that pay has been. So who would be eligible? Who would be eligible? They would only they would receive the lower principal pay if they had a break in service, um, if they came from out of state, if they were a teacher and moved directly to a principal position, or if they were not eligible for teacher pay while in a system principal position. So, what are the issues with it? Again, we have the top of the scale ranges going all the way up to 46 years, which was necessary when we had the extra step, but those that's no longer. I would like to state that um, the same as the, I mentioned that we had 10% of our assistant principals on that bottom step. We have 42% of our principals are currently on the bottom step for their classification. And that is again because of the number of years it takes to get off the bottom step. 42% um, are on that, um, that first step of their classification. Other issue to consider is that only state-funded uh, certified personnel are uh, considered for the um, for the classification, and we have over 2,000 possible pay levels for 2,400 positions. Um, each principal has to be evaluated individually and assess how they should be paid, and that every principal or assistant principal that is not paid off their specific pay schedule has multiple line items to be coded to in order to account for this. My last slide is just to show um, kind of a history or, or a trend of where our average principal salaries have gone. Um, both these lines are taken on only state funded. So this is what they're being paid off the state salary schedule. Now, as Lanier talked about, principals weren't lose, they didn't get less pay. And what this really shows is that you can see the decline in the principal um, average salary. And this is showing the, a lot on what the distribution is. For instance, we had in 2009, we had 40% of our principals had over 25 years of experience. In 2016, we now have, um, I'm sorry, we had 40%, yeah, 45, 40% over 25 years. In 2016, we have 25% over 25 years. That may, for some, appear to be a good thing to flush through and, and um, rotate. However, on the other side, we have 42% that are on that bottom rung. So um, that's why we're seeing a lot of the decrease there. On the principal schedule, you'll see that uptick recently. Um, that would be attributed to the fact that they are now basically paid, many of them are basically paid off the teacher salary schedule. So they've um, been beneficiaries of the General Assembly additions to that salary schedule. Uh, the other thing to mention on the local supplements, which I have not talked about because we do have uh, superintendents here that certainly can address it, 
but the, the local supplements have increased 10% over this time for our principals and school-based administrators in general. And looking at it, they are, they are compensating for many of the things that are uh, not working in our salary schedules. They're differentiating between a high school, the complexity of a school, a high school, middle school, elementary. The total number of staff supervised, not just the state certified staff, they're looking at whether it's a magnet school, a year-round school, a specialty school um, to uh, accommodate. And every single, unlike with the teachers, where not all the, the LEAs are providing uh, supplemental pay, uh, every single LEA in this state is providing using their local funds to uh, support the state salary schedule in order for the teachers to be, uh, excuse me, the principals to be paid. And it might range from a couple hundred dollars to $28,000 in some of these large school districts with complex um, complex schools to manage. And with that, 